Now for me to do at the moment is to introduce uh, Michael, um, who has described his introduction uh, as a provocation. You're welcome. I'll allow you to make a point. So, so we had a brief discussion yesterday about uh, whether or not to stand up or sit down, and uh, uh, I decided it's better to, it's better to, to remain seated. Um, otherwise, you might think I stand up, but I'm, I'm an authority. But I'm not authority, so or, or, or all of destructive art plays, uh, that, that's best left to people like John Roberts and, and Andrew Wilson. But uh, I was lucky enough to meet Metzger in the 90s, and um, uh, he twice invited me to give a gallery talks about, about uh, his work, so that's my connection, my personal connection. But I prefer to think of myself in, in terms of John Latham's um, artist placement group, the terminology of uh, John Latham's artist placement group. But uh, the artist is an incidental person, so I prefer to see myself as an incidental person when it comes to destructive art. Anyway, uh, destruction in art uh, symposium 2.0. Yeah, that implies both continuity as well as rupture. A genetic link with the series of manifestos formulated by Gustav Metzger from 1959 onwards as well as freedom from those protocols which can look over didactic to 21st century art. Destruction and Art Symposium 2.0 also references the groundbreaking event Destruction and Art Symposium held at St. Bride's Church and the Africa Centre in Covent Garden in 1966, a battery which would charge a new generation of artists employing and deploying destructive means in in his jacket notes to the 2015 Bedford Press facsimile edition of Metzger's 1965 lecture at the Architectural Association, Andrew Wilson describes his legacy in terms of monuments. Uh, of monuments that would change and disintegrate over time, extolling the complete codification of the theory and practice of auto-destructive art which he had developed over the previous five years. These statements were Auto-Destructive Art, 1959, um, Manifesto, Auto-Destructive Art, 1960, Machine Art, Auto-Creative Art, 1961, Manifesto World, 1962, and On Random Activity in Material, slash Transforming works of art, 1964. At the very start of his 1965 lecture, Metzger maintains the view that autodestructive practice was 10 years behind theory. And to support his isolated and vulnerable anti establishment position vis a vis artworks, and let's remember in those days there were still only two respectable disciplines taught to art, artwork, painting, and sculpture, he cites dynamic thinkers from earlier in the 20th century. Bruno Minari's Manifesto del Machinismo, Laszlo Mahogany Nagy and Alfred Kennedy's Manifesto of 1922, in which they declare the artist a, quote, active partner to the forces unfolding themselves. And now Garbo's remark in the German Circle, 1937, that sculpture was the real movement of substantial masses. So kinetic, volatile, and ephemeral rather than monumental. Metzger certainly lies and aligns himself with kinetic art, but worries it is liable to become a toy. I think we all know about ball-bearing desktop novelty in Newton's grave. Nevertheless, he promotes auto-destructive art as, quote, an important step in the enlargement of forms at the disposal of kinetic art, and that's underlined in the original manifesto. Uh, and the shelf life for its artefacts, ideally 20 years only. So, Destruction and Art Symposium 1966 and the unplanned spin offs was less a great leap forward than a catching up of practice with theory. Against this historical precedent, today's symposium stroke salon. Is dedicated to a survey of contemporary artists whose practice embraces destruction, taking Al Qaeda's attack on the World Trade Center as a moment 
aerodynamic churn. Despite Carheim's Stockhausen's overblown pronouncements about 9 11 being the quote, greatest work of art in the entire cosmos, <laughs> the televised moment was seismic. Age old frameworks of meaning blown apart from using a geopolitical gear shift from a bipolar into a multipolar world with diverse actors, one in which the human subjects become mediatized, fatally entangled in digital networks, a global environment in which art can no longer afford to be parochial and innocent. I think one of the reasons Stockhausen got so much flack is that he was, he was adopting it. A purely Nietzschean approach and, and regard, regard, by regarding the event as, uh, in thinking in aesthetic terms, and that, 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 that the world was in, the world could be justified simply in aesthetic terms without taking any, uh, any account, taking into account the, the number of victims. And so it was lack of empathy which got him into trouble more than anything else. <coughs> uh, with the rise of hard to please social media, the dark web and the incessant street robbery homicide, it's hard to, to discern the actions of scattered, auto-destructive artists. Their dematerializing aleatoric gestures often lo lost against this backdrop. By and large, unable or unwilling to critique Metz's main ideological target, the dealership system, because they are not complicit with it. While one of the most important goals of the 1960s, i.e. the blurring of the wall between art and life, has ironically meant the types of transgressive art that become normative by default. So, who are the new practitioners of auto-destruction? And this is just a, a, a list now. Um, Maria Arcao, Plastic Waste Retrieval. Eleanor Bartlett, Tar Painting. Jeremy Bennekin, Erasing Proofs. So, he, th this, this artist has a future for David, uh, David Blackwell. Um, David Blackmore, Rage Rooms, which you can see images of over there. And incidentally, I, I, I actually think that, that uh, there was a kind of rage room or, or an appliance uh, invented in Japan in the 1990s uh, that precedes the American, American rage pen um, concept. Uh, it was designed, it was, it was an appliance designed for salary men in Japan who were working far too many hours and, and, and were unable to let off steam and, and it was something you could actually buy. And assemble a home, a kind of TARDIS so you could have your own flat. You go inside, soundproof TARDIS, so you go inside and let literally let off any, any steam that they're trapped inside. So, so that's basically the sort of recent history of the, of the range of the concept. Uh, uh, bookends, return to the list. Bookend, sorry, good bookend. I mean, we've got their video over, over there playing, it's on mute at the moment. Uh, that's uh, Matt Hale, and, uh, also known as Matt Hale, and Nick Cash. Uh, Matt Caldwood, Dangerous Performance. Jake uh, Dinos Chapman, Determinant of uh, Classical uh, Art Paintings. Uh, Abraham Cruz Villegas, Auto Destructive Kitsch. And that's just my, that's my viewpoint. I just think that he's an artist who's kind of riding on the coattails of auto destruction. Uh, and his work I mean, appears to be auto autodestructive, but uh, final analysis is only type of kitsch. Um, Roderick Davis, Roderick Davis, Welsh Heart Violation. Richard Harvey, Visible Repair. Um, Dinara Casca, Patisserie. Uh, you might well ask us, uh, what's Patisserie to do with this autodestructive art? Well, uh, my proposition, which might be a bit absurd, is that. Uh, very sort of high spec producer, which takes an awful lot of time and energy to, to produce, um, uh, which is then just eaten, is actually kind of the type of self sort of, of auto destructive art. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's an article here which shows that uh, the, the, this, this artist, uh, Dinara Kaska from the Ukraine, actually worked very closely with an architect, and all her, all her pastries are, are actually based on architectural models. And she says here that. Um, um, the results are much as you might expect, a mix of ornately geometric desserts, angular pastries, jagged sponges and symmetrical souffles that offer a precisely measured two fingers to the typically unpredictable rough edge form of bacon. So we're not talking about meat pies and waffles here. 
And at the entrance of the hut, he was transforming the object of art into something edible that would later perish, while emphasizing the ephemeral art, its fleetingness in our life. Anyway, to resume my list. Um, Michael Landy, that was Shredding. Uh, the Belgian artist Chris Martin, Vars Smashing. Sam Messenger, Cryography. Christina Vincenzi, Wounded Books. We've got an uh, example of her work over there in the corner. Uh, Glenn Onwin, Chemical Baths. Sarah Pick Pickering, Detonations. And these are some of the photographic vestiges on the wall here. She'll be speaking uh, in a moment. Uh, Antonio Riello, uh, Diabolus in vitro, which sounds a bit sinister, but it's just books that he's burnt and placed inside uh, different kind of glass vessels. Um, Kate de Silvi, Curated Decay, and uh, I can strongly recommend her book, Curated Decay, it's a well worth a read. Uh, Michael Tomper, The Paul Fairchild, Smartphone and Vandalism. Uh, Anna Pintora, Interrogating Representation. And here we have a specimen of his work. Uh, Vladimir Yumenex, Yellowism. What on earth is that, one, might I ask? Uh, well, he's a Russian artist who belongs to the same generation as, uh, of artists as Pussy Riot. He's also done time in jail, did 18 months at uh, Majesty's Pleasure for um, defacing uh, Paul Rothko's, uh, uh, Rothko's um, uh, Black on Maroon. He imitated uh, Tate Modern. Uh, he, he just went in there with a magic marker and reauthored Rothko's painting. Um, uh, my, my view is, well, why not? Uh, he got 18 months in prison for that. Uh, the list of names is by no means comprehensive, but gives a general idea of a broad range of methods and aims being adopted. Some more nihilistic than others, yet all working cheerfully against a deterministic proof principle of commodification, which in effect means the art market, even if they realise only too well that this strategy is a double crime, in which processual leftovers themselves can easily become merchandise. Notwithstanding in the and Billick's words, the end, quote, the entropic quality of art's structural and critical trajectory is its resistance. So these 2.0 artists constitute a sphere rather than a movement. Who met in 1961, South by an acid nylon performance, Herman Lynch, Theatre of Orgies and Mysteries, and John Nathan's book club, in which we saw an excerpt from recently, uh, in the basement of the better books, are actually ancient history. <coughs> uh, one way this background tension plays out is through reenactment. Specifically, reenactment with a twist, which sets out to avoid simplistically embalming the past as heritage. Instead of throwing a typewriter from a car travelling at high speed, Simon Morris and Howard Britton restage Ed Bruchet's Royal Road Test. And uh, the video, uh, video of that is online. Um, yes, so they restage Ed Bruchet's Royal Road Test using Freudian confetti. Nicholas Bentall brokered ad space at $92.59 a square inch on top of a Robert Rauschenberg print in a tribute to his iconic erasure, erased to of 1952. Japanese artist Tomoko Hojo's work in progress, unfinished descriptions, invites composers to imagine the content of Yoko Ono's undocumented piece, 014, from her solo show at the Indica Gallery in November 1966, a few months after Ono's participation in, di in Diaz itself. Such reverential stunts, stunts loop back to canonic works of the past, forced to comply with the dominance of the art market since the 1997 Sachi collection shows sensations of the thrill over the concept. Yet, auto destructive art tends to fuse both memes, giving its documentation great archival significance and an impact even in its naive form today. For where materials are placed under pressure, as in the David Platt platforms, a uh, rail piece that we saw in the job, or desire to fail in the aesthetic terms, the universal experience of childhood is evoked in what Esther Leslie 
paraphrasing motivation was called the child, the child's impulse to revolutionary overall. Thank you very much. Well, well, oh, one last paragraph. Okay. <laughs> Christoph Nestor's great artistic contribution was to reach out to science and technology before it became fashionable to do so, and use an array of substances and tools in a bid for interdisciplinary freedom, i.e., cardboard, compressed air, carbon dioxide, glycerine, graphite, hot plate, laser, laser beam. Lentils, liquid crystal, mica, nylon, photographs, plastic tube, polystyrene, religious statuary, statuary. And you might well ask, well, uh, yeah, what about that? Well, it, when he was a medical, was a junk dealer in, before, he, before he moved to London. He was a junk dealer in Kings Lynn and uh, uh, squatted in the building and uh, was responsible for an impromptu exhibition of the uh, set, 16th century. Uh, Statues that have been defaced or had their heads chopped off by uh, Cromwell's, Cromwell's um, um, new model army. So um, it was very interesting when uh, the tape show from in 2013, Art Under Attack, which was predictably, predictably chronological, but it did start with a group dedicated to the, to the English Reformation and all the, all the uh, damage that went on, on in, that, in that era. And I think you, you need to go back to, to the English Reformation. Uh, to, to actually get a full, uh, full, kind of, uh, full body understanding of, of the role of destruction in, in, in the sort of English psyche at least. And I, I can't recommend highly enough a book called The Stripping of the Authors by uh, Eamon Duffy. Um, but anyway, to get back to the list of materials uh, that's going to employ. Uh, rust, uh, silicon, slide projectors, steel, stroboscope, sulfuric acid, water jet, etc. Sometimes it's translated as boycott or pop art in the name of revulsion or strong public medicine, seeking, as he said in his cardboard statement of 1959, quote, nature unadulterated by commercial consideration of the contemporary drawing room. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to apologise for interrupting you. Um, if I may, um, I just wanted to kind of go back to something you mentioned in your text. So I'll start by reading it out. And, um, and then I have a question for you. Uh, so with the rise of power to police, social media, the dark web, and incessant street robbery homicide, yeah. it is harder to discern the actions of scattered auto-disruptive artists their materialising allegorical uh, gestures often lost against this background. By and large, um, unable or unwilling to critique Metzger's main ideological target, the dealership system, because they are complicit with it, while one of the most important goals of the 1960s, i.e. the blurring of the wall between art and life, has ironically meant that types of transgressive art have become normative behaviour by default. So, uh, the first... I was wondering if you could expand on that, but the first question I really have for you is that do you think that, um, given your wealth of knowledge and experience, um, that critical practice um, runs counter, it can't exist within the gallery system? No, there's no can't, there's no can't about it. Uh, obviously it can, but uh, it all depends on how, how much compromise you're willing to make. And w would, you, would you see the museum um, system as a more... Uh, I just think that the 60s are kind of like, almost like a sort of romantic era or maybe a romanticised, but the artists in the 60s are sort of a, a romanticised um, because they stood out, whereas now there's our participants, well, apart from the celebrity culture, the adoption of celebrity culture by, by art, artists, the artists are going to stand out and say, well, they're kind of getting paid in society more, and so it's more difficult for them to get, I think it's more difficult for them to, to get notice if they're working in a kind of more sort of Skill field by auto destructive art. Um, because as I say, there's an atmosphere of violence now abroad. And, uh, so the, 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 uh, it could just be dismissed, and it could dismiss my media as just, oh, why do we need this? What, what, what's it actually saying? Is it saying that there's an enormous amount of destructive art? That's the question. And 
like the lists of artists that you mentioned towards the end in, under the banner of 2.0, um, do you think that the, the way in which they, they make work or the, the, the sites in which they present work, um, the strategies they employ to critique the institutions, um, may offer a development? Yeah, I think, I think the whole thing is um, undergoing a, 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 is, is morphing. I, I think a lot of destruction of art is morphing. I don't really know where it's, it's going to go, but I, I, I'm trying to kind of move away from the first generation, We're almost like the founding fathers, if you like, of, of auto, of the auto destructive um, uh, sort of lineage of artists, and um, see how the, the contemporary artists have worked with destruction. Not necessarily alluding to Mexico, or, because I don't really actually believe, uh, believe in uh, or agree with what Andrew Wilson said that Mexico entirely codified, uh, codified um, auto destructive art. I, I, I don't think that's possible for a start. And also, I don't believe that he's right when he talks about um, Mexico's work as monuments. And I think it's, it's so, I think it's up to an artist to work against the monumental. Uh, um, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Does anybody have any uh, questions? We could ask Michael now, or we can wait until the yeah. end. Yeah. Michael, just to expand a bit more on this idea of perhaps we are in the context mm -hmm. sorry, sorry. in which an artist tries to do or make more destructive art or destructive art. Um, I mean, I have to mention Brookhaven okay, because that's the project I did. With the cash, we did it in the library, and so we did. I felt that what we were doing, because it was not in the gallery, but it was in the library, and we were dealing with books, mm -hmm. that the experience of, of the visitor to the library would, like, it's rather than being ineffectual, perhaps this would be a part of the art world market, which is seen as you know, an isolated space. It was, out, it was trying to be in the world, as it were. Yeah. And then use the, the objects that were readily found there, presenting them in a different way, that, that, that perhaps was more effective. Well, that's controversial, controversial as well. Can, can you switch your video off just so the well, audience can, think, can yeah. hear that, that kind of. Because if you, it, it, you probably won't know, but uh, he's talking about an exhibition that took place in Westminster uh, Art Reference Library. And so this was the background why. Uh, of the work. Uh, you give me a second. <laughs> yeah, so. I'm not trying to I hate to do crap with work, but I No, it's not to do with that. Just give me a second. I'm just with a plane, and so people saw video of these activities on the books that they saw in the library. Yeah. So that, that was the uh, art on the attack, which was the takes. Well, I think it's rather lame. Rather lame because actually, I think yeah, that's something we can actually talk about. The title of the tape, Tape Britain's Show from 2013, Art Under Attack. I thought that was a very lame title. I don't know what any, anybody ever seen so far. Say why? Because it implies that, that the attacker was some kind of alien, uh, and uh, that the art object was the art object was a sacrosanct thing. Uh, uh, was under attack, whereas the actual uh, and what it misses out on, what this what mess was so interested in, <laughs> was the notion of attack or kinesis, or kinetic energy. So actually, the actual attack of an artwork, say you say the uh, uh, Chapman Chapman artist, for instance, is it's, it's, it's not just to do with the end product; it's also to do with the gesture. And so I think that title misses out on the whole the notion of the gesture. Um, uh, as, if, as if the art object is of environmental analysis and you know, it's, it's beyond, it's, it survive, will survive beyond any kind of uh, uh, transgressive attack because ultimately it's, it's the object which can be valued in environmental analysis and it's not the gesture which counts but it's the object even if it's been damaged or you know, uh, modified in some way. So I, I just think that was kind of very materialistic, the way it was fra the phrase and formulated was very materialistic. Kind of demeaned the sort of the action, uh, the, the action part, uh, and that's a very sort of strong element in the auto destructive art, particularly um, uh, Austrian, uh, um, Austrian uh, actionism. 
Uh, and, and it was the action, the performance was much more important than the end product. And so I think the, the tape was kind of commodified, commodified and he was very well by himself. Um, unless anybody's got any other brief questions at the moment, we'll move on. Um, thanks, Michael. There will be time at the end, as I said, for kind of more in-depth questions.